historically, we have um, parsed patients with low-grade glioma into high and low risk using clinical variables, such as, for example, age, extent of resection, um, type of histology, things of that sort. But with the advent of molecular categorization of most CNS tumors, and in particular low-grade gliomas, using conventional markers like IDH and 1P19Q, we clearly understand that these markers have the potential to both be prognostic as well as predictive markers. Unfortunately, because these, the recognition of these markers is revolutionary in terms of predicting prognosis and potentially therapeutic outcome, occurred while the major clinical trials were still ongoing, they have never really been weaved into a prospective clinical trial per se. So most of the data that we have that correlate the molecular features of low-grade gliomas and outcomes as well as therapeutic impact rely on retrospective evaluations. In this context at ASCO this year, we looked at RTOG0424, which was a single arm phase two trial in high risk low grade glioma patients using radiation therapy with temozolomide instead of the classic regimen of PCV chemotherapy. There were 129 patients that were eligible for this study and were enrolled in this study. And because what we were trying to do was to correlate molecular markers with outcomes, we had to go back and obtain tissue from these patients and only 80 patients had sufficient quality tissue for DNA extraction for IDH and 1P19Q analysis. Uh, the patients were categorized into three groups. Uh, the first division was IDH mutation or wild type. So when we looked at these 80 patients, about two thirds, 67.5%, were IDH mutant. That is not a surprise. We expect that the majority of these patients would be IDH mutated, but about a third were IDH wild type. Now further, we were also interested in finding out how many patients were co-deleted on top of being IDH mutant. Uh, 26 uh, of the IDH mutant patients uh, were also co-deleted. So that's about just under 50% of the IDH mutant patients were also co-deleted. So co-deletion plus IDH mutation existed in approximately a third of the total uh, patient population group. So a third had both the prognostic features in their favor, IDH mutation and co-deletion. So we wanted to look at the outcomes of these groups, IDH wild type, IDH mutated, co-deleted, or non-co-deleted. And what we found was that both IDH mutant subgroups were significantly correlated with longer progression-free survival. For the IDH mutated co-deleted patients, the progression-free survival was um, 8.1 years. And for the IDH mutated non co deleted patients, it was seven and a half years. So, this of course was significantly better than the IDH wild type group, where the median progression free survival was only 2.3 years. So, to put this in perspective, low grade glioma patients that are IDH wild type have outcomes that reflect and are similar to those that we see in grade three anaplastic astrocytoma patients. Whereas the outcomes that we see in the IDH mutated patients are significantly better than the wild type patients. And in particular, if we overlay the code deletion status on top of the IDH mutation status, the outcomes are even more favorable than in the IDH mutated but non code deleted patients. We did both a univariate and a multivariate analysis of this trial, and both the molecular IDH mutated subgroups, i.e. the co-deleted and the non-co-deleted, continue to remain significantly different than the IDH wild type, even after all of the clinical variables were incorporated. So what this study suggests 
is that grade two glioma patients who harbor mutations in the IDH gene, whether it's IDH1 or IDH2, most of them are IDH1, will demonstrate longer survival when treated with radiation and timazolomide compared to IDH wild type tumors, regardless of the core deletion status. But of course, if they are core deleted, they appear to be doing even better. Now, there are many caveats to this. We were not able to evaluate all of the patients because we didn't have tissue on all patients. And as we start looking at subsets of patients into these three groups, the numbers become small. And so the statistical reliability of the data are somewhat weak, but the trends are all in the right directions. So now that we understand that um, IDH mutations play a significant role, at least in prognosis, in terms of uh, predicting outcome for these patients, one of the new areas of interest is to understand whether blood-brain barrier penetrating IDH inhibitory drugs could have a therapeutic role in tumors of the central nervous system that express IDH mutations. We know that extracranially in lymphomas, these agents have demonstrated activity and appear to be quite promising. The data presented at ASCO this year suggest that both the non-enhancing and the enhancing component of the disease in IDH-mutated tumors shows either stability or response when IDH-targeted drugs are being used. So this is very intriguing because these drugs are molecularly targeted. They appear to get to the target. They appear to have at least some preliminary clinical activity. And what remains to be defined is the true magnitude and extent of the therapeutic efficacy of these agents. And most importantly, how they would play out in a combinatorial manner. Will they, for example, allow us to completely obviate the need for radiation and chemotherapy? I think it's far too early to jump to that conclusion. Will they potentially allow us to de-intensify the magnitude of radiation or chemotherapy? Once again, these are early days. It's far too early to make that kind of a supposition. Uh, but these are clearly very intriguing questions that will frame the basis of new trials and development for combining IDH inhibitory agents with either radiation alone or a combination of chemoradiotherapy in patients with IDH-mutated low-grade gliomas. 